When I was 18, I go to college, so I need a job to get some cash. So I answered an announcement asking young people to come to a coffee shop and there we'll be told what the job is. I get there and they tell me that, in fact, it is to go sell things door to door, to sell stuff. So we get into a van and we go to some village and they give me a bag with some candies and you have to go knock at the door and sell the candies for 10 times their price, of course. But you got to sell the bag of candies. So I sell my bags of candies and the guy comes back an hour later to pick me up. He says, how many did you sell? I say, huh, well, all of them. So he's surprised. He says, oh, really? So he gives me another bag. One hour later, he returns. He says, how many did you sell? I say, all of them. So he does not understand, and I'm starting to feel that, hey, I'm onto a good thing here. At the end of the day, I have made 1,500 francs at the time. 250 euros. So it was really fabulous. I realized that if I could do this all month, I could make more money than my father just by selling candies in a village. I could not understand what the difficulty was and then I understood later that it was very easy for me to sell things because I knew what to say and how to say it to anybody because I was in connection with their energetic structure and I just very simply pronounced the words that were necessary to convince them. So it was very easy for me. So eventually I dropped my studies and then I started to sell stuff, all kinds of stuff, and that's how we started. But finally, to do business or to be a clairvoyant is the same thing. It means you are in connection with the world of the other person and you enter into this world. For example, when I look at a wall or a chair or a person, there is what belongs to the matter. That's about 2% of what that object is. Then 90% of the void, or 99% of the void that is in front of me contains the information that includes the nature of this matter. Within this void, you have all the information that you can think of. The more you let your body feel things, the more it sends you back information about what you are in the process of contemplating. It is not a gift or a talent or anything special. It is like, for instance, when you enter in a room and you have information about the room. You know if there is a good ambience, a bad ambience, a good atmosphere, if there is aggressiveness in the air, etc. That is clairvoyance. If you accept to feel that and do not doubt the perception that you had when you entered the room, you will have more information and more and more. And the more you work with it, the more it becomes refined. And that is just a tool that is very refined, but it is the same tool everybody has. When you walk into a place, you have some information. In fact, that is the defense mechanism that I used. It is why it has developed so quickly. It is the mechanism that I have found to integrate in my family. That is the mechanism that I found to integrate in school, with the teachers, and with my active life. In fact, it is a tool that I found to be in connection with people. My structure, at the start of my structure if you wish, my structure is that of a cheater. I look at the other person. I know what it is that I have to say and do when I start to cheat. As a matter of fact, when I started to do my work as a therapist, I was cheating a lot with people. What I mean by that is, I would gather a group and I would say what it is that they wanted to hear. So of course, I was a fabulous therapist, because when you tell people what they want to hear, then there is nobody against you anymore. I was doing this because I did not feel I was up to it. I felt powerless. I needed to feel valuable, to have power back from women over men of my age, with which I needed to gain the upper hand. And I noticed that a very sharp tongue is just as efficient as any other tool to be in power. But this quickly reached its limits because when I was telling people what they wanted to hear, I could not see anything in the mirror of what I was. So I was not making anything move in other people because I did not want to move anything inside of me. I just wanted to be right. So consequently, this system very quickly found its own limits. It has been necessary for me to suffer from the situation so I could move my misguided ego, change things about my pride, about my absolute need to be recognized, to be seen, to be loved, etc. So workshop after workshop, because within several workshops a month, every time you move something inside somebody, you move it inside yourself. 
it was really necessary for me then to do the work of recognizing myself within others. The more I advanced in this process, the more it was necessary for me to be true with what I was picking up. When you see that the other person is right in the middle of a lie, you have to recognize that you are in the same lie. Otherwise, you cannot create a change in that other person. So, as long as I was not ready to look at myself as a liar, I could not say to the other, your problem is that you are in the process of lying. But the more I understood the benefit there was for me to recognize who I was with honesty, the more I could give the other what I was really seeing within him and not what was necessary to say for him to love me. The more I was able to tell people what I was seeing within them, the more I was able to grow in my own life. The more I loved myself, the more other people loved themselves, and the resolution started to really move from me from that point on. It is not like you are misusing your power and therefore you are punished by some kind of power. It is just that whatever you send out there in life, you get it back. So I used to send cynicism, I got it back. I used to send nastiness, I got it back. I would send force to dominate people, I got it back. It means I would have the same thing back that I was sending. Naturally, the universe could not care less about our actions. If we behave well, we receive something good. If we behave poorly, we receive something bad. You simply live what you are sending out there into the physical world. I simply understood that we are in a vibrational world where everything is made of frequencies and energy, and that every word you pronounce is an energy. That is why prayers exist, because a prayer is a frequency that is sent. And in fact, when we speak, we are always praying. Every one of our vibrations, everything we emit, everything we let go out is a command we give to the universe. If we vibrate fear, we give a command to the universe to make us live circumstances where we have the opportunity to feel that fear. By the same token, if we vibrate joy, we give the universe the command to give us more joy. With words, it is the same thing. Each word is a vibrational key, and if we use the words in a particular combination, we create vibrational keys. This is the way I work. Because this organization of words, one after another, even if they do not have mental coherence, they have an energetic coherence. And once they enter the energetic structure of the person, they will modify his or her aspect, therefore the incarnation in the matter. When you receive a word that moves your energetic structure, your life moves because your life is the absolute byproduct of this energetic sphere in which you navigate. So every time you live an experience that modifies your energetic sphere, practically the expression in the matter will change. You explain that we always get what we ask for. How come we do not experience that in our daily life? We always receive exactly what we ask for because we are the byproduct of a vibrational equation. This vibrational equation is made of what is conscious in our mind and also of what is unconscious. So consciously, I want tons of money to enjoy life and experience freedom. So we are saying, well, this is what I want, but it is not my experience. Because what I ask the universe, it is not what I ask my voice. It is what I ask with my vibrational equation. Everything that I express consciously and non-consciously. So consciously I'm going to say, I want big bucks. And in fact, what I really want consciously is not money, it is freedom. And then I'm going to say, I want money. But at the same time in my subconscious is written, money is garbage, it rottens everything. Money has destroyed my family. Money is the reason half of humanity is about to croak. The fact is, we have a conscious request and we express a non-conscious vibration that is emitted. Actually, when I say we always get what we ask for, it means we always live the exact results in the matter of what we have expressed at a vibrational level. Matter is agglomerated energy. It is polarized energy, positively or negatively. When I vibrate something, I accumulate similar energy. If I vibrate all day long, the world is aggressive, the world is dangerous. I will end up by having a real experience that demonstrates the veracity of my system. That is the rule of the game. Everything we think becomes true in our system. That is why one cannot prove spirituality. Because those who think there is only matter, they have the proof of it. Those who think they are not the masters of their life, they have the proof of it. Our creative freedom is such that we can even create the experience of having a feeling of not being a creator. That is what is crazy about it. The rule applies so much everywhere, every time, and with everybody that everything you believe becomes true. 
So if you believe you create your reality a little bit, but not entirely, you have the proof. If you believe you create the positive in your life, but not the shit, you have the proof of it. If you believe that guys are unreliable, you have the proof of it. If you believe that women are a threat, you have the proof of it. And you will always have the proof of what you believe. Why? Because what you believe becomes a vibration. It is a vibration that you send that you emit all around you that some call the electromagnetic field or the aura. Your entire belief system is written all around you. This is where I go dig for my clairvoyance. It is in this energetic sphere which I call the structure. This is where I go dig to get information about you. Because around you, even in what you are saying, and even what you do not even necessarily know about yourself, there is all the information about you. These informations are all commands to the universe. This is what you are saying to the universe. You see this aura here? You see this sphere around me? Fill it in with what it is already. This is how we command the universe. The first attempt would be to think, if that is the case, I could modify this energetic sphere to obtain different results. Indeed, as far as what I'm aware of, I can work on it. I can start to love more and more of who I am so that the universe answers. You love more and more of what you are. With other therapists, we can go see what is in my subconscious sphere so that we can become aware of it. We can make the conscious sphere larger and start to work at it and to accept more and more who I am. Let me repeat. To accept more and more who I am and not to change who I am, which is a sign of denial. Not to transform who I am, but to accept it the way I understand it. The idea of the work is to stop the work on oneself. It is to understand that the more I work on myself, the further I go from who I am, therefore not loving who I am. Loving who we are is simply to acknowledge who we are. If I can admit this fact, I can fill in the sphere around me with the joy of being myself. At that point, then, I start to fill in my sphere with a prayer, a command to the universe, which is, fill it in even more with the joy of being me, the contentment of being me. We have to come into this place where we say, what I am is okay, it's all right. By simply agreeing to be who I am here and now, I fill in my sphere around me of the joy of being me. I can assure you that life gets much easier. All the energy that was supposed to come to you finally comes to you. As long as you try to be something else, it is hard on you. I have experienced this for myself. How do we become comfortable making our own choices and taking risks? Rather than letting ourselves be driven only by our desires, by what makes us happy, we are going to match our desire and what makes us happy with the entire world. When I say the entire world, I mean our entire world. We want to be validated by our friends, our family, by the people around us. We want things to be accepted by everyone. So we will naturally have a tendency, while we are searching for our path, we have some clues about our path. We are going to look for a consensus, rather than to plunge into our own experience. Signs, you are the ones putting them on the path, and you are the one who interprets them. The invisible is constantly talking to you. It is constantly revealing to you who you are. What you see outside is just the exact replica, the mirror image of the vibration you are emitting. So we create a sign, we interpret it, and then we say, I got a sign, that's the right direction. We need to convince ourselves because we are too afraid of our choices. We are too afraid of being ourselves, and we are even more afraid to be criticized by our choices. But our choices will excite us. They will give us higher value that will bring us happiness in life. Only then we will be the masters of our own choices. It is when we make decisions, going from us back to us, that we feel real excitement. Consequently, when we make decisions that mommy would have made, that daddy would have decided for me, that society would have decided for me, then I'm only the good little doggy of mommy or daddy or society. And it is not what is going to bring me the excitement of who I am. What do you want to make sure of in your life? Against what kind of threat are you trying to protect yourself? You're going to live what you came here to live. You're going to live your experience. So what could happen in your life if you start to be the person you really want to be and to do exactly what you want to do in your life? How could being the person you want to be and doing the things you want to do create unhappiness in your life? Has the fact of controlling everything, constantly searching for guarantees, doing things seriously brought you the joy and lightness of being? 
Is your functioning functioning? Has the way you understand life made you a happy, free person able of letting go with the total clarity? I don't think so. What tickles me is when people come to tell me, what do you think? Things don't come out of the blue. It's not that easy. People who live with this level of belief, they experience just that. And in addition to this, their system has never made them happy. That's the crazy part. When at 20, it did not make me happy, I said, darn, it does not make me happy. And at 25, finally what I think and what I believe still does not make me happy. And at 30, darn, what I think and what I believe still does not make me happy. If I persist in believing what I believe, there is a moment when I'm going to have to stop screaming at the world. If what you believe does not function, change something in your life. So if you have to change something in your life, change it for something you adore doing. So when I know instinctively, instinctively is good enough, what I want to do. I throw my body and soul into it and I stop searching for validation. If the geniuses of our days had waited to be validated by others, we would believe we live on a flat planet. Nobody would have had the courage to find the theory of relativity. Nobody would have had the courage to love like Mother Teresa. Nobody would have had the courage to accomplish new things. All of us would do what everybody else is doing. Therefore, no one would have done anything new. Therefore, we would not have discovered neither fire nor the wheel. Fortunately, there are people who dare at the moment to discover things that are not discovered yet. By daring to say things that have never been said, and by daring feeling things that have not yet been validated by their surroundings. What is going to make it happen is that you're going to touch your genius, that you will live your most beautiful experience, and that you will go beyond the fear of disappointing everyone by living something that has not been proven yet, that has not been demonstrated. It is when you're going to live something for which you have no proof that you are right and even that it is not rational. That is when you're going to really have an excitement and live something new and bring something new to this world. I am guided by events that are happening and at the same time I am the person I want to be. If you feel like screaming, you scream. If you feel like crying, you cry. If you feel like laughing, you laugh. Look how children function. You want to know how to live? Look at children, you'll know. That's all there is. It's all life. The seriousness you put on top, it's fear. The anxiety of the control you cannot have over your life. Simply because control and anxiety are the two sides of one coin. So when you go play, I control my life by thinking everything. In fact, you are generating anxiety. When you are creating expectations in your life, what is underlying expectations? Disappointments. The more expectations you have, the more disappointment you will have. The more control you want, the more anxiety you create. And that is where there is a marvelous human invention, suffering. When you are sick and tired of suffering, you have to see the relationship between inside and outside. The first time you have a breakup, you think, this guy was a jerk. The second time, this one has nothing to do with the first one. After six months with him, you say, darn, he is the same as the first one, he is the same jerk as the other, and the third one is the same again. Then you tell yourself, the problem is me. So it is because of suffering that you become the creator of your own circumstances and stop projecting outside the fault, which in fact is not a fault. It is by way of suffering that you become the master of your circumstances. Otherwise, you do not want to change. You only want to be right. At first, there is an attempt to reject the fault and when we suffer enough to say, okay, enough messing up. I'm the one who is the common denominator between all my failed experiences. At the end, it all comes from me. So I have to pick up my marbles to acknowledge my role as a creator and from that point on to change direction. To do something different today is to accept being who I am and to stop constantly trying to change myself. This is when the gifts are coming in. This is when I stop kicking myself every day trying to be something else. This is when I stop destroying myself, believing that I will be more worthy of love when I am with a guy, when I am with a woman. That I will be more worthy of love when I am wealthy rather than poor that I will be more worthy of love when I am recognized at work better than before, when I stop tramping on myself. The energy can finally reach me freely without having to receive lessons on an ongoing basis. If life does not give me exactly what I want all the time, it is not to piss me off. It is only because there is a few things about myself that I need to acknowledge, 
To recognize them is enough. You do not have to get into a dogfight when all this is not recognized. The fact is, you got to carry it on. Live your life. Life brings only the necessary theater so we can experience the emotions we need to experience, so all this finds a resolution. You do not need a therapist. You do not need to be clairvoyant. Life will bring to everyone that which needs to be understood in order to find your own persona, to simply accept to be who we are. There is no other battle to fight. There is no need to say, ah, but if I push in this direction, if I do this or that, it will bring me this or that. If I say this, if I'm nice, this person will do this. All these kinds of calculations. This kind of manipulation brings nothing in your life. It does not create anything. It only creates a persona that is so afraid to be wrong that he will be wrong. So afraid to hurt others, he will hurt them. So afraid to fail, he will fail. There is no need to hurt in order to evolve. On the other hand, we so very much enjoy being right that once we are right, we do not want to move a thing so we create suffering to move forward. At least, personally, I often functioned like this. I have been in circumstances in my life where I was so totally comfortable. I had everything I wanted, my little paradise, my wife, my kids, my home, my pile of cash. I had everything I wanted. So I had to create diseases, ultra-violent sciatic pains that changed my life, stroke. Things that are in fact events that create pain and that I create to allow me to get rid of the persona that I enjoy too much. Because when you, in a persona that is so comfortable at all levels, it is very hard to make it the evolve. Suffering is a motivation that we use a whole lot but that it's not necessary. This being said, to return to the beginning of our discussion, evolution is something we create when we want to stop evolving. Evolution is more a fact of letting go than it is a product of action. Letting go is not something we create. It is only something we cannot do. You go to live. It's that simple. In fact, life is designed to be lived. And the theater we live on a daily basis Bill showing up, your cousin comes to visit, your car refuses to start, or some good news, or anything like that. In fact, living life is enough to create the energetic dynamic necessary to resolve the variety of equations born from our need to drive energy. To live life is enough. In itself is a solution to life. Things always happen right on, to resolve the equation at hand. For example, I'm in my life living the equation. I'm entirely involved in my theory, involved in my certainties, and I'm extremely tight in my beliefs. My landlord comes and tells me that I have to move. I've lived in the house for 12 years. The environment is wonderful. I really do not want to move out, and I wonder why my landlord shows up and asks me to move out. In fact, my landlord asks me to move out because if I live life, meaning I simply answer this order, I pack my stuff and I go live somewhere else, my certainties, my limited beliefs of, I understand it all, there's nothing more for me to change, all that will change. Because when you move out, new parameters and so forth, you change. Therefore, what life is offering. If I live it, it will create in me the changes in function of what was necessary for me. It is not necessary to be spiritually aware. There is no need to know, to be clairvoyant. There is no need of a therapist. Things happen in my life, I react to them by having emotions, by living emotions. I resolve the emotional equation that is presented to me. As simple as that. To live life is the solution to life. Everything else is blah blah blah, to try to understand, to hold tight, and to control. When it comes to how are we going to get out of this is when we believe that we have to get out of it. We got to get out of it because the world is aggressive or because the world is real and outside of yourself life is hard and you have to suffer to make a living. If that is your belief system, it will be your experience. If you want to live in a space where, on one hand, you are the creator of your own experience, and on the other hand, life is hard and you have to fight, then you will live with the two realities. Therefore, you will live with these two realities. You have the proof that you are indeed the efficient creator of your experience. Dare living beyond that and see what happens. It is entirely dependent on your belief system. Some people are so convinced that they will succeed and they will actually succeed. Some people are convinced that nothing happens easily and they have to fight for everything. It is almost naive, I would say. The most naive are the ones who succeed. Do we really have free will? Which part of our life is predetermined? There are several layers of free will resembling a fractal structure. Just imagine that your being wants to experience emotions. Because, in fact, there is only one important thing on this planet. It is to live experiences that create emotions. Emotions are like energetic fireworks that bring you, if you wish, to other levels of play and realization. 
What will let you move from one level to the next are the emotions you experience. So you are seeking particular emotions and when you experience them, you reach the next level. So it is sufficient for any being to string pearls of wisdom that we call emotions. Every new emotion we experience is a pearl of wisdom in the being's basket. It is the being's free will and it is never contradicted. Whatever are the emotions the being wants to experience, it is what he will experience. At the same time, simultaneously at a fractual level, meaning as an exact copy of the first level, you have the free will of the human being at the lower level. Those are the choices you are going to make in your life. Whatever are the choices you are going to make, one way or another, you will end up experiencing the emotions your being wants to experience. To live emotions, you can achieve that in any situation. Whether you are rich, poor, tall, ugly, whatever, you can experience emotions. Because the emotions you want to live do not depend on the outside, they result from your inner choice. We have a choice to be angry, to be happy, to be sad or not, as we please, when we please. Nobody can force us. If someone wants to force you to be sad, they cannot do it. If someone wants to force you to be happy, they cannot do that either. So, at the human level, we have all the choices we want. We are walking to our destination as it is pointed out by the being. The way we are fulfilling this contract as humans is the manner in which we are going there. Do you want to go there on your knees, hurting or laughing and skipping? This is your choice, but you will end up in the same place. Because the being has decided that he needs to experience this particular state of being. As a result, I would strongly suggest that we be guided by what we love. It's that simple. But as long as we are involved in stuff like, if I go that way I will miss something, etc., that is a 3D fantasy. People who come to my workshops are doing well and they have to tell themselves a story that they are not doing well as to justify the fact that they are coming to see me. Most of the time, the first five minutes are dedicated to demystifying their false sense of unease because we are in a society where being a victim automatically puts you in a category of being a nice person. So people have created a system where they are victimized. That is hard to believe. The world has been divided into there are the nice people and there are the mean people. The mean people hurt the nice people, so the nice people are victims of the mean people. So now, as soon as you are a victim, you enter the camp of the nice people. It is extremely simple. Now, it is enough to be a victim because of mommy, of daddy, of society, because of the crisis, of the war, because of the world government, of chemtrails, of junk food, because of anything and everything. We create enemies, more and more enemies. Every time we find an enemy, we justify that we belong to the camp of the nice people because all the sides are the sides of the nice people. All the protagonists of every war in any part of the world are the nice people in that story, and everyone is fighting in the name of the good against the bad people. We are too blind and self-important to wake up to that fact. People that I attract in my workshops, they say to themselves, okay, I'm going to see him. I better have a problem. So they invent a problem. Clearly they invent a problem. They do not invent it in order to come to see me. They have already invented it in their life. People are going to say, I have never been loved by my parents. They have no memory of what has happened in their life before five years old. They have no memory of the reaction of their daddy at their cradle. They have not been rocked for hours, maybe. No one has changed their diapers, maybe. No one went to work to fill the refrigerator, maybe. They have completely forgotten these little details. But people forget that entirely and only want to remember how mean life has been to them and how they are being stopped, how they are blocked. People all come with the same sentence, I am blocked. It is important to have a blockage because it justifies why I am not the person that I want to be. The idea is not to erase our contradictions, but to entirely embrace them by saying, I am big and small. As long as I want to be only half of myself, only the pure, only the beautiful, only the big, only the nice, only the generous, I will live with only one eye, looking at only half of myself and denying who I really am. And this denial of who I really am, which is hot and cold, big and small, black and white, light and shadow, the more I deny my shadow, the more this shadow will appear and in the material world. The more you want to see in yourself only what is positive, the more what you do not want to see about yourself will appear in your material world because the inverse of what you are is always with you. We live in a relative world. We are both things at the same time. When we refuse to be half of ourselves, it will appear in the material world. 
And that is why the material world functions as it does nowadays. Why, in fact, people look on the outside and cannot recognize themselves because they want to be only half of themselves. They want to be pure only, generous only, big only, nice and attractive only. Once we understand there is only a consciousness which observes the matter unfold through us, we understand there is nothing more to do, only to be. Then comes the next step, a level I found even more wonderful. Once we have touched this sensation in contact with the divine, that there is nothing for us to do, just to be, now is the time to start doing things. It is exactly because there is nothing more to do that. We can start doing things. It is now free. It is all fun and games. It's only for play. It's when we understand that there is nothing to accomplish, only to be, that we start again to do things. But we do not do things for gain. We do things for pleasure of doing them, to play. So, of course, when things get serious, when we have forgotten that we are at play and the material world has become really serious because our children are sick, because we die, because we hurt, then it turns really serious. Then we want to take off. And all of a sudden we want to see life like this. Show me only what is beautiful. Quick, quick, bring me back to unity. I hurt too much here on this planet. But when we return up there and we understand well that we came down only to play, that there is nothing to do, only to be, then we return to the material world. Then we return to the duality. Then we return to, I am big and small because I am carefree. I am big and small. I am here only to play. It's not for real, like when we were kids. When I am mean, it is sitting on top of, I am nice. When I am self-centered, it is sitting on, I am generous too. When I am big, I am small. I am this incarnated duality. That's what it is to be human. You did not notice? Feet in the mud, head in the stars? Why is it that we have forgotten that we are the creators of the reality we experience? It turns out that in time immemorial, we have conceived our physical bodies as vehicles to make us experience a world of relativity. But before being humans, we are different beings who have the pleasure of manipulating genetics to create spheres of life like this planet and then on this sphere created bodies that have incarnated these bodies in order to play. In order to stay alive, these entities have been given the fear of dying. So we created a mechanism called the ego. That gives us the fear of dying and preserves life and survival. The result is, when your entity comes to the edge of a cliff or a volcano, instead of falling in there like an idiot and having to reincarnate again to continue to play, the thing is, when he comes to the edge, he stops short because built in, there is this need for survival. The problem is, the vehicles we have created function independently, which means when they start to believe something, it becomes true for them. We started to forget that we are gods, and it is a plan within the plan, since the gods that we are are very happy that we forgot we are gods, because that is truly playing. When you are playing at life so much so that you forget that you are actually playing, you can imagine the intense quality of the game. It is not a little video game where you know that dying is not a big deal, you have more lives. Here now, we are totally immersed into it to the point that we even entirely forget that we are gods, and the game is so intricate that even though it might be 200,000 years that we are into it and totally forgetting that to start with, we are gods who are not in waiting because they are not in the time-space continuum. Since time and space exist only in the world of relativity, but when we are watching ourselves play, we are not waiting. We are in the process of having this experience. So for us, caught in this incarnation, totally believing that we are our bodies, in a complete panic to lose the bodies of our dear friends and loved ones and in the fear to lose our own bodies, we are caught in the material world and it is not a game anymore. You see how crazy that is? But we have been so far, and so far in the matter for hundreds of years, thousands of years and thousands of lives that today we are beginning, and that is the beauty of humanity for me today. We are starting to remember that our true nature is to watch ourselves playing. And, in fact, we are here to have a blast and enjoy ourselves in the world of matter. I want to add something, to insist on this perspective because it has changed my life to understand it from this angle. Because not only I am no longer angry at the founding God that I am, the genetic creator that I am from a far, far, far away past, and we do not even care about this today because today I am essentially Frank the human, lost in the physical like everyone else, but at least I am no longer angry at this part of our shadow. 
because first, I have understood that it is me, and secondly, I understand what it is at stake, but there is something else. You know the angels? Do you realize that angels in all cultures, they are at the service of humans? We pray to angels and angels intervene. We are about to die and angels save us. We are about to live something difficult. Angels are coming to the rescue. Isn't there something that makes you feel uncomfortable with that? They are always behind us humans trying to save us. Don't we have a life to live? You see something like that, what's the matter with angels? It seems they are hooked to us and they have only one purpose, to love and to help us. But in fact, when you come into contact with these particular frequencies, they really are like that. And you know why they are so much at our service? It is because they are beings that have not had the courage like us to go get lost so far into the physical world. An angel has no free will because, in fact, its free will comes to this. I am God. The free will of an angel is to always choose God. An angel can choose only love. Angels choose God always. God only and nothing but God. They are never lost in the physical world. Angels admire us because we have a free will that allows us to choose light and shadow, to choose God or evil, to choose hate or love. Angels admire and support us because we have been further than them. We are going to a place where we completely forget that we are God. We are completely lost according to our own plan. It is our most profound choice to be lost, and that is why we are here. So of course, and I understand this, when we have entirely forgotten we were at play, when we do not understand anything about the rules of the game, and we only want to believe in the rat race, and nothing exists but what we believe, people are so far from this reality that indeed, at that point, their life has an incredible intensity because it is really scary. And finally, even to understand all this does not make the game less intense, because I am always as much scared for my kids, I am always as scared for life, I am still afraid to die. I am still a human, entirely. But there is something that brings back a level of enjoyment because I am starting to understand what it is we are doing here. You see, it is a little less meaningless. It is a little less unfair. What is the process of incarnation in this world? What is the part of us that does not incarnate? When we arrive, when we are born on this planet, I would say when we emerge at this level of reality, because that's what a birth is for me. When we emerge at this level of reality, we download the card for this level, like in a game. So immediately, at birth, you download the environment, if you wish. If we both were to take a look out there and pick up a handful of pebbles, if we count them, we will have the same number. So we are indeed facing an objective reality which is the decor, the field of experimentation, into which we will produce our experience. Another point, everyone is convinced that we all see the same thing as they do. I do not live in the same world as you do. We do not see the same things. We do not encounter the same books. We do not watch the same news at the same time. When you turn in your computer, those are not the same news either. So everyone absorbs what he needs from the world, and if we select only one part of this objective reality, it is because we select the part that we need to go through this particular experience. We are not sometimes alive and sometimes dead. We are, to make an analogy, constantly alive in the invisible world, constantly that never stops. Our invisible self is eternal and once in a while, and it is once in a while for the part that is incarnating, since the invisible part is not subject to the space-time continuum from time to time. I focus my thoughts to the point that it is becoming so dense that it polarizes into positive and negative and it becomes matter. So I am creating bodies by polarizing thoughts. But not only am I creating more than one body at a time, I also create a multiplicity of me simultaneously to go through simultaneous experiences in the multiverse, but each one of these experiences will be aware only of it itself. However, at no point in time am I exclusively incarnated without my invisible self. I am constantly in the invisible, watching after all these incarnations, and parts of my greater self are incarnated in a physical experience into specific time and space. What is neat is that all these incarnations, meaning what, I am here in 2016, I was born in 1973, 
because it was necessary for me to live a particular experience at this time when the environment is specifically what it is and the human race vibrates in this fashion because I need to pick up the information I'm going to gather on this plane to help my side incarnation to live what it is in the process of living and to help my side incarnation of 500 years ago, 600 years ago, 2000 years ago, 2000 years into the future to bring information to all these parts as they are active. All these lives, in fact, are simultaneous. So if I am in the process of living in a plane with little avatar, we continue to be in Bernard Weber, in the process of creating your stuff and looking down at it. We the gods, and looking down at our little creations doing their stuff, it really is a perfect image that he is creating for us. So I am here, playing with my little creations, and one of them is in the process of living something a bit hard, a bit too dense, a bit too violent. He is in a cotton field, running, with a dozen dogs after him, and when they catch him, the dogs will tear him into pieces, and he will be hung to the highest branch of the domain. You see the picture? We are in 1847, in a cotton field in South Carolina. You are in the process of living this experience. You are starting to feel the dogs breathing on your heels. Right now there is something really freaking you out and you feel that for the being. What you are experiencing is going to be too much. It is not going to be possible and he's going to die on the spot under the shock of the fear of being way too high. So for the gods above, we are thinking, no, 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 this one is too important. I need for my avatar to continue to live. I want something else for him later. I want him to get out of this mess. I want him to be safe. But the frequency he needs to channel at this instant is way too strong. Because each one of our emotions, if you wish, is like a frequency that has to go through us. This frequency, when it goes through us, it moves us. It is like a kundalini rise. When you have a faint frequency that goes through you, you lose your dog. It creates a frequency that makes you cry. What makes you cry, in fact, is the rubbing of the energy within your energetic channels. If you live something too strong, emotionally, you are going to die, so time stands still, since time, in fact, is made of pulsations. The master above says, well, now what do I do? This one is on his way out, but I need him because I want him to make this specific experience with him. No problem, I'm going to create another emanation. So he creates another Frank in 1973. We create an emanation and Frank is going to be born in 1973 in a family where the father is a dog trainer and the mother is crazy about dogs and we have a kennel. So he grows up with the dogs and stuff like that. For him, the dogs, that's his drug. He knows how to talk to them, how to look at them. He knows every tone of their barking, the meaning of every growl. He has zero fear of dogs. It is not even a subject for him and the Frank who is growing up with this knowledge of dogs every time he goes to sleep, like everyone is doing in their life, he is going to make an update with all his other incarnated counterparts. The Frank who is running in the cotton field, the slave with the dogs running after him one night, while he was asleep, he had received the information from the Frank who knows everything about the dogs. So when he reaches this critical moment of total panic, he will know that the dogs in fact are excited by the masters, but they are not hungry, and if he turns around and speaks to them in that special way, here is what is going to happen. He has gathered the information that allows him to experience this sequence of events. So here, I give you information that is not really true because it is so complex that I cannot give you the real information. Because the Frank born in 1973, he is born for 10,000 reasons of this kind. And the one running in the cotton field born in 1812, he is born for 10,000 reasons like this, and these 10,000 reasons they will have a resonance with the one born in 1500 who has 10,000 reasons and the one still active now who was born 500,000 years ago still rubbing his flints. That one is picking up information. You see how that works? And it is the same for the future. So all our parts in incarnation create a gigantic equation that completely escapes our understanding. What I just told you is ridiculous from the standpoint of the complexity of the current equation, considering that the gods we are have an intelligence such that it totally goes beyond our understanding. So there is no interest for us to go beyond the limits of the game. We are here to play. If we stop playing, we have to recreate an emanation and start again. Is there in the universe some more evolved consciousness observing us and who would like to help us? We were speaking earlier of our past long time ago, which, in fact, is our reptilian brain, our most profound atavisms, the creative part of this creature we are, meaning our own God. It is just us and a perspective so large that it is difficult to understand it. 
By the same token, at the other end of the spectrum in our future, you will find highly evolved civilizations like the Pleiadeans or this kind of energy or frequencies. They are not beings or ET or things like that. I talk only about energetic frequencies. When I talk about reptilian ancestors, about an angel, a unicorn, or a dragon, or my extraterrestrial from the future, those are exclusively frequencies. It is not more real than that level. For me, frequencies are the only reality. So when we talk about forms, ancestors, future things, unicorns, dragons, and such, we are talking about the illusion that the energy embodies when we contemplate it. Energy is energy when we are looking at it. It takes a form. This form of the future, which could be a Pleiadean, in fact, it is the same thing, which means us, seen from a distant future. In fact, these very evolved civilizations cannot evolve any further than where they are, because they need for us to evolve since we are the same thing. When something wants to evolve, every part of it has to evolve. If I'm the past of my double in the future, when he wants to continue to evolve, he has to help me to evolve. That is why they are helping us to evolve. They actually helping themselves to evolve. In this lifetime, you have exactly the same example. The man you are today, if he wants to evolve, he has to go observe the child you were and heal the trauma from childhood so the man can evolve with it. If the man you are today keeps trying to evolve and does not try to heal his wounds, such as a lack of love, lack of recognition, lack of a thing or another, the man of today finds himself blocked in his adventure. These highly evolved beings who are interested in our development, it is actually us, watching over ourselves from a distant future since all epochs of time are simultaneous, we exist simultaneously in the entire spectrum. They are helping us through all these channelings, the crop circles which are coming to this planet, information that will manifest through a variety of channeling or by readjustment of vibrational frequencies not useful to us, we do not even know about them, like the activation of some sites, of certain crystals, some life form connected with it such as whales and dolphins and so forth. We are not aware of the work that is done, we do not need to know it. The game we are playing now, why we are on a polluted planet, a planet where there is war, why we are seeing these things as a reflection of ourselves. We are on a planet that is teaching us the concept of casuality, the relationship between inside and outside. As we observe what is happening on the planet, we are in the process of integrating the phenomenon of a creature creator. We are creatures, but we are also creators. We are starting to become aware that every time we are moving energy, it has consequences. We are learning that when we throw our cigarette butt out of the window, we end up with a polluted planet. We are learning that when we throw plastic out of the window, we end up having dolphins dying on the beach. We are learning the principle of causality between what I am producing and the effects it creates. Before, we could not see it simply because we did not have the technological tools to know that when you do something, it has an effect worldwide and today we see it. Today we see that your little fascism of not accepting yourself in the mirror, to judge yourself too awful to be capable of functioning, to find yourself to be a really stupid idiot, creates wars on the other side of the world. Or some people are so convinced that they are good on the right side of the issue, they make war with their neighbor. And for you, it is a war you are starting early in the morning looking in the mirror. We are slowly learning the rules of causality between inside and outside, and in 2500, maybe the planet will not be polluted anymore, but the new challenge will be to integrate accelerated energy, and every single one of my thoughts become reality. Right there it is another challenge. Every time I think about a polar bear, it shows up in my living room. What do I do then? And we could live another problem at another time, you see. So now we are living a window that is 2016, and the teaching is, why is it that everywhere the only thing we see is distress and death? Because we are constantly brewing that stuff in our mind. We are learning the causality principle between inside and outside. So we put face to face with a planet that is dying. And we are sold stuff like, quick, give it a CPR, it's got to come back to life. I would like to point out that the Gaia is a being that we have difficulties understanding. Because it vibrates in more than three dimensions, it is more than the rock we know. This being could not care less if it is made of gas, plastic, tires, petroleum, flowers, forests, beautiful rivers, and beautiful lakes. The planet is itself, no matter what happens, whether it is made of plastic or petroleum or flower petals, it is always the planet, and she does not care about its form. As far as this is ongoing anthropomorphism that pushes us to believe that everything on this planet is afraid to die. It is us, humans, we are afraid to die, and again, I mentioned this earlier, we are afraid to die by the rules of the game. 
The final conclusion I would like to bring to our discussion is that a lot of religions, civilizations, books are centered around a simple concept. In our hearts, there is what we are for all eternity. You know the concept that in your heart there is the marvel that you are? The divine sparkle there at the center of the heart chakra? There is the divine sparkle, the time zero, the absolute, the divine. We are told if you want to enter in the heart, you have to love yourself. So many books on this subject to love oneself. Of course it becomes all complicated because we are also told that to love oneself is to hug oneself, to be gentle with oneself. We are not quite sure what this is all about, so it is very complicated. When you are told, all you got to do is just to love yourself, you go home with that, you can spend 10 lives on the subject, you cannot understand it. So here is how I want to write things. Imagine that at the center of the heart chakra, there would be a tiny, tiny little dot. This tiny dot, we will call it the eye of the needle. When I enter the infinitely tiny of this tiny hole, I find the marvel that is frank. The thing is, to enter this tiny hole, the eye of the needle, I have to accept being infinitely small. It is when it is the passage that is taking us here. I agree to be infinitely myself that I can go through to find the marvel that I am. Not because it has been sold to us before. If I have to love myself, I first have to become a wonderful person. We were told, behave this way and that way. When you become saints, you will be able to love yourself. When you love yourself, you will go through the eye of the needle to find the wonder that you are. I am telling you something else. Accept who you are now. I mean simply who you are at this moment. Without becoming something, without changing yourself, without having to evolve, simply who you are at this moment. When I accept that, the banal and mediocre human being that I am, I accept both of the polarities. I am big and I am small. That is the experience I have made in my life. Sometimes I am a neat person, sometimes I'm not, sometimes I'm generous and sometimes I'm so stingy. Sometimes I'm afraid, sometimes I'm not. And everybody makes its experience. This is who we really are. So, I accept the mediocrity of this result, the good and the bad. I accept the mediocrity of this polarity entirely. And to accept it means that I recognize it on the outside. I identify myself with the terrorist as well as with the hero of humanity. I recognize myself in both understanding of the polarity and as I recognize myself. It is possible and this is a byproduct, if you wish, it is also possible that as a consequence that I may find the wonder within me. So the point is, mark a step. First, I accept sincerely to simply be who I am, period. And it is possible that we discover that the banal human being that we are is also wonderful. Thank you.